You know, when, when I look at my career, I, I've been extremely blessed in a lot of ways. I've, I've done things that I would never envisioned I was going to be able to do. And now, you know, I'm thinking about, well, how do you wrap all this up? When you die, nobody really cares how many cases you did. Nobody really cares how many papers you wrote. But they do care what you leave behind, who you've helped, what you've built. Well, I'm Michael Joseph Reardon. I'm a title is a professor of cardiothoracic surgery and Allison Family Distinguished Chair of Cardiovascular Research. And I work in the uh, Department of Cardiovascular Surgery at the Houston Methodist Hospital. So I get up every morning at 4 a.m. I drive in, I, ch I check my email, I get a cup of coffee, I change into my workout clothes, I walk over to our outpatient building, I walk up to the 23rd floor, I spend time an hour exercising, I walk back down, I shower, and by quarter to seven, I'm there identifying my first patient and ready to start my first case of the day. So the case is a uh, lady that's about 60, uh, early 60s, who had a previous uh, lyomyosarcoma that now has an eight centimeter mass in her left atrium, which is starting to obstruct blood flow. And if, you know, if we don't fix this, uh, she's gonna go into heart failure and she's gonna die probably within the next month or so. And these tumors are complex because the left atrium is, is really in the very back of the heart. And it's so big that we can't get it using normal techniques. And so what we developed going back into the 1990s for these left atrial malignant tumors, is either taking the heart completely out or most of the way out so we can roll the heart up and see the, the posterior chamber resect these very large tumors with good exposure, repair them appropriately, and then sew the heart back in. And so it's something that we've been doing since, I think I did my first one in 1998. And we now have probably the largest experience in the world. Uh, so we think she'll do well. Uh, and we'll get this fixed and get this young lady back on with her life. Yeah, yeah come on and sit down. That's going to be closest to where you and I are going to be working, too. But the, the mitral is free, although partially obstructed from that. So I, I do think that that won't be able to do this just kind of with a partial to look it up. So I think we're going to be good. To, and the cath, of course, was, you know, you'll see the cath, it's all negative. Ready? When you were a kid, was you want to be? Well, I wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up, but they wouldn't take me. And then I wanted to be a fighter pilot, and that washed out, too. And then I went to college to be an engineer because my father was an engineer, but that was too hard. So I went to doctoring because it was easier. And that's what I ended up doing is being a doctor. or a transcatheteric valve replacement is really a, a fascinating thing. It's the concept that we can replace your aortic valve with a valve that's mounted on a catheter without taking your old valve out, just shoving it out of the way. When this was first being discussed in the 90s, people thought it was a crazy idea, thought it would never work. Well, so before this, we were doing surgery. And, and surgery we can make through smaller holes, but you always see the heart-lung machine. It's always more invasive than TAVR. Whereas TAVR now, I go up through your leg. I can do this with you awake. I can put your valve in, I send you to the recovery room, I send you to the floor talking to us, and most of our patients go home the next day. I've been very fortunate that I've been able to run four of the five big national trials in the U.S. and TAVR, and I think that's a testament because people understand the infrastructure we have here and our ability to take, both take care of patients and do research. Like I'm, just, I'm just gonna change shoes. I've learned that if you, if you wear your good tennis shoes, they end up being bloody tennis shoes. So we're just gonna, you're gonna change for surgery. Okay. Yeah, Ready? Get all that out. Now that there's no tension in the line. 
still got some spin. There you go. That'll lay flatter for you. You'll be happier, I promise. Yeah. Uh, wait, get your pair of cleats in there. We're like a little suck in there. I was gonna look at the. You, no, 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 no. Yeah. You were looped okay. around. Your, now, now put that on there. Now put what you're doing. But when you went out, you looped around one of your shoes. Right. Now you're good. There you go. Now go on bypass and let's get your cardio fleet needle in, clamp, we'll take a look. I'm in teaching mode right now. When heart surgeons first come out, what they typically want to do is prove to people they can operate, because that's what surgeons are. That's the, the coin of the realm. But once I thought I could operate and thought people understood I could operate, then I wanted to learn how to teach surgery, which was a whole new process. And so I ran the residency program at Baylor while I was still chief at Baylor before Baylor left. And I really found that to be one of the more fulfilling parts of my life. And so I've continued on. We have a, a cardiothoracic residency here. We have a, a vascular residency here. And I have to say, you know, the opportunity to teach really is the highlight of my day every day. So this is the imaging on that young lady. And what you can see is the aorta looks like it's spared, but the left main enters, and you can see it. Well, at least one big OM, one LED, if we have to do that, I think that'll cover everything. Yeah. I think one of the problems we're going to run into is, is that you know, the LED and the, and the circ, if we have to take it, are, are going to be disconnected from each other. So. Do you ever find where you can kind of like... Yeah. And so we've done, I've done three just like this Almost in the pulmonary like route, and, kind of and, 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 and twice I've been able to save the coronaries. You know, since it's the we've developed this uh, conjoined program uh, which we have developed over several decades and again something that we've helped spread to other institutions and something that uh, here is now kind of co-directed with, with me by Marvin Atkins, one of my partners. Uh, Marvin will eventually take over this program so that the program that we've built over decades will go on at the Methodist Hospital. My role uh, here at Houston Methodist is kind of multifold. I'm the director of aortic surgery and then also uh, have a prominent role in the uh, cardiac tumor program here uh, in conjunction with Dr. Michael Reardon. Uh, over the last five years, I've been working with Dr. Reardon, uh, seeing patients in the clinic, as well as uh, working with him in the operating room, uh, resecting uh, these tumors, uh, helping patients out. And uh, at some point down the road, um, we'll be transitioning over uh, leading the program. He's very fast, uh, very efficient. Uh, really has a game plan going in and uh, you know knows how to speed up and uh, keep the operation moving along and and many times we'll do these really complex operations and uh, you know I typically am surprised at uh, uh, how short the operation and the pump time was uh, just because he's so fast no wasted movements most places do not have uh, folks that are comfortable dealing with these. And so uh, Dr. Reardon over the last 30 years has really created uh, the center of excellence in the United States for um, cardiac tumors. And I'm just really proud to be a part of that. I, I've been extremely blessed in a lot of ways. I mean, I, at, at age 16, I met the woman that I fell in love with and, and, and married her at 22. And now at 70, we're, we're still together and we've had two beautiful children and four grandchildren. I, I couldn't be more blessed personally. At a professional level, I, I came here, I got to, to train with and get to know later personally, Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley, uh, something that very few people can claim. I, I work in what I think is the best medical center and the best hospital on the planet. And so I look at my job now as program building and career building. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the legacy that was handed to me by the people before me here at the Methodist Hospital. I just want to make sure when, when, when I do decide to hang it up, hopefully not for a couple of years, but when I do, that legacy is passed on to others and that Methodist Hospital remains a world leader, remains as strong as it's ever been. The really important thing is to see the surgeon of the future, Dr. E. <laughs> if you pick the problem that needed to be solved, and you focused on that problem and spent your time on that problem, you'd get very good at it and you'd get known for it. But what I would tell young surgeons is you have to keep an open mind and you need to be prepared to grab the opportunities when they come up. If you're thinking about doing this and you're willing to dedicate the time to become a really good heart surgeon, I think you're gonna live a great life. I still get up every morning. I can't believe people pay me to do this and, and, and have fun every day, but they do and it's still fun. Someday will occur when I don't operate anymore, and every morning I will get up and have coffee with my wife, and every night I'll have dinner with my wife. 
And I look forward to those days. But they're a couple years off still. <laughs>